Mr. Casey, if you would like to resume the witness stand, is there anything we need to address before we bring in the jury? No, thank you. Okay. Please be seated. Welcome back, everyone. Ms. Dahl, you may continue. on October 9th at approximately 3.55 p.m. Do you remember that, sir? Vaguely. Have you reviewed a transcript of your audio recording with Tony Murad? Oh, yes, I have, yes. Uh, at that point now, on October 9th, in the afternoon, where were you at? I was at, a, at that time, it was called Banner Good Samaritan Hospital or Banner Good Sam. I believe it's University Hospital now. I had just come out of, if it's the ninth, I had just come out of uh, at least two surgeries, so I had been in surgery nine plus hours. And Detective Murad met with you. Who was in the room? Uh, at that time, I believe it was a detective. My wife were the two that I remember, and there might have been other medical staff, but those were the two that I remember. And uh, do you know if uh, Detective Murad read you the photographic Advisement, yes. Advisement. Yes, you did. Yes. And did you know at that point whether there were any suspects in this case? No, I did not. I didn't know anything about the case other than you know what had happened to me. But had anyone come in and said, "Hey, you think we know who the guys are, and this is what they look like?" Oh no, no, I had. I've never. I had never received an update to that point. No. And in fact, was this really your first interaction with the Phoenix Police Department investigators regarding your shooting? Yeah, it was basically the first time I was conscious, or, you know, yes, yes. I want to show you what's been admitted as exhibit number 50. I'm going to put a uh, photographic lineup 91665 up. Is that one of the people that you identified as being in the car? Yes, I did. That's correct. Did you later learn, for example, during this trial, that was Valeria Hyman? That's correct. And she was the one seated, seated between the two males in the rear seat. And during your contact with Detective Mraz, did you indicate that the driver was a black female? Yes, I did. I'm going to put line of 83006 up there. Now, did not identify Lori Richards, said, but you identified, you said that this person looked completely different from the other people in the car? That's correct. I'm going to put line up 91666. Uh, you identified that person as being the other female in the car? That's correct. And well, Vanessa Martinez, the woman whose identification you got, was in position number five. You identified position number one, who you thought looked similar? That's correct. But I, with Vanessa Martinez, I really had no dealings with her um, other than asking her for her license. Uh, that was about as much interaction as I had with her, so I really didn't, I, I had no reason to, I didn't have much interaction with her other than her giving me her license. She wasn't the focus of my attention, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Now, line up 83031. That one, you identified number three, correct? That's correct. And he was the male seated behind the front passenger sleeping. And in fact, did you put where he was? Oh, yeah. In the vehicle on the back of that photographic lineup? And that. Write something. What did you write? Uh, gave a false ID. Now line up 83030, you identified person in number one, correct? That's correct. Although Ramon Bueno is in image number two. That's correct. On the back, did you indicate where that person was in the vehicle? I did. He was right behind the driver rear passenger. Gave false ID when asked for his real ID. I remember hearing loud bang. Um, 
And if I, if I may, on that photo, if you could flip it over, um, if you look at the two, when I dealt with Ramon that night, um, he looked like number one because he was gaw He was a lot skinnier than he was, and he didn't have that full-fledged goatee that he did there. He was much skinnier or much thinner as looking at the picture, number one. He didn't have a round face as he does in that picture there when I dealt with him that night. Did you know who, did you know anyone by the name of Ramon Bueno before this night? I had never met one of those people in that car that night, much less Ramon Bueno. Or any of the other occupants that were later identified? No, I had never had any previous uh, personal and or law enforcement dealings with any of them. Yes, I have. I look for that uh, CD very quickly. And you and Trooper Alfano had a conversation about not dying uh, on the street before this night, not letting the other person die. Can you repeat that question? Other's backs should something ever go down when you were on duty? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Trooper Cruz and I had become pretty good friends right from the get-go when I came into Metro. Um, he basically showed me a lot of the area. Um, uh, you know, he showed me the area and, our, you know, our, our beats, and he was a big help to me. Um, I always thought of Ray, like, as a brother. So, uh, yes. At this time, Judge, I'd like to play what's been admitted as, as exu Exhibit 247. Objection? No objection. Exhibit 247 may be played. Oh, 325, code 4, sound white. <laughs> what are we hearing there? That was the what I was explaining to you in the beginning. Um, that I just said Charles 25 code four sounded like, meaning that that warrant that that traffic stop that I was on was uh, the warrant had been quashed. I was code four. There's no need for backup. So it was a separate incident than this traffic stop at the Knights Inn. Five ten four. Thank you. Two thirty six. Attention here for pedestrian north on I seventeen south of Thunderbird, walking off right. Male with the gray. Pants and a white shirt backpack. What was that in reference to? There was a pedestrian walking on the freeway, which, in, as other troops have stated to you, on the midnight shift, that's not an uncommon thing. Um, unfortunately. Charles 323, Cactus 17. And that was Trooper Alfonso stating he was heading that way to go respond to that call. Who is the dispatcher? Uh, Debbie Fajardo. And is she known as being someone who is calm, literally under fire? I, f I think she's top notch. So, yes, very, yes. I'll bring it to assist Capital 312 at 1038 Frank, 17th Avenue in Washington. Charles 314, I'm not down here, I get there for my stop. What's happening there? On the, was that a different call over uh, regarding on Washington? Oh yeah, 10 foot, yeah, I'm sorry, yes. That was a different call over Washington. Um, another trooper was heading to a, a call assisting a capital unit. Charles 314, 10-4, 256. Charles 326, can you show me 19 at 325? 
What's happening there now? Okay, so this, uh, that was Trooper Cruz, and now he's letting dispatch know over the air, dispatch air, not car to car, that he's letting dispatch know he's heading my way. Um, so he has heard, just so you know, so you get an idea, he has heard the trap, he heard me ask um, Trooper Alfano on car to car to head down my way. So that's how he knew I'd ask for help. So that, that's why he went over dispatch. He said, I'm on Charles my way. 10 Charles 325, code 20 to stop, Knights Inn, southbound 17, McDonough. Okay, because uh, in that instance right there, because uh, Trooper Cruz had said he was in on his way to my location, um, dispatch is now checking to make sure I'm code for or okay, or did I need immediate assistance? And I, you know, so she's just checking if I'm okay at that point. Is that what you mentioned before regarding code four? Yeah, that, yeah. I'm, I'm letting her know I'm I'm a code four. I believe I'm about to tell her I'm going to run ten, five, ten, twenty nine checks or twenty nine checks, and those are warrants. Going to call for another unit, but I hear three two three. Oh. Sorry, three two six is on its way. Ten four two fifty seven. Three twenty five back. I'm also going to run five twenty nine checks. So if you get any warrants, just let me know. Seven twenty five ten four two fifty. Charles, 323, 1019 from Campbellback. What's happening there? Trooper Alfano is now diverting from the pedestrian call, and he's now coming down to assist Trooper Cruz and I. Charles, 314, we have any major cross streets where that capital unit's at? He's at 17th Avenue in Washington. What's that referencing? That's the uh, capital, the unit that's heading over to the capital unit to assist with uh, that officer. Asking where a uh, better location of 17 in Washington is. Yes. Where are you, 1019? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not sure on that 1038. I'm getting no record found on the name he gave me. What are you talking about there? Okay, right there, I have now run one of those two names. Um, and it's coming back with... Um, what happens when we have a, a sound alike with a warrant, it can match a date of birth um, or a name, a last name, common, very common thing. So uh, sound like mean there's a warrant in the system but I don't have positive ID on this person that I'm dealing with, so I don't know if this warrants for them or not. So that's why I say sound like at this point right now, because I don't know who I have. Charles 25, 10 Charles 3 on 4 on 97. And that unit's just arrived oh. in the capital. I'm sorry? Oh, so that unit 314, Charles 304, has just arrived with a capital unit at uh, 17 in Washington, I believe. At this point, are there still only three uh, DPS SUVs there? Yeah, there was never more than three the entire stop that I, that we, you know, the whole thing went down. So if, if there was going to, if, if following the shooting, a responding marked sedan, DPS sedan was there, that is after this shooting? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. The only three people that were there during this incident were myself, Trooper Cruz, and Trooper Alfano. There were no other DPS cars, Phoenix police cars, just our three cars were the only three police marked vehicles there. 304, 10 10-9 Copy Whose voice is that? That's Trooper Cruz just uh, advising dispatch that I've been shot. He's request 999-998 is emergency.
record made for exhibit 50 on the Alamo? Five zero. Yes. Thank you. When you met with uh, Detective Butcher on October 10th, while you were still in the hospital, did you talk about the shooter being behind the driver? Yes, I did. Did you describe physically the differences between the person behind the driver and the other male and the other individuals within the car? Yes, I did. What was it that you shared with Detective Butcher? I explained to Detective Butcher that the male seated behind the driver appeared to be a lot older than the other four in the vehicle. Um, he was an older Hispanic male with a shaved or partially shaved head with a, a slight goatee. And uh, he was wearing a white or a gray t-shirt and uh, dark jeans, or appeared to be jeans. Did you actually know exactly the order in which the names were written down on your notepad and share that with uh, Detective Butcher as to who was sitting where and who gave which name? Yes, I did. Uh, like I said, uh, the three names that were on the notepad, or as you saw, that went right in order of the, per the rear seat passenger behind the driver, the middle female, and then the male that was sleeping on the window was the third. Did you indicate on October 10th that you said to the rear passenger seat driver, hey man, you know, I'm going to find out who you are because I'm going to fingerprint you, one roll you. Did I, did you say that? That's correct. That's what I was talking about with forgery and bringing him in to uh, one roll him or fingerprint him to get his true identification. Do you see the man who shot you in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Would you please describe where that person is and what they're wearing? He's sitting at the defense table. He's got a white shirt, a gray tie, and he's wearing glasses. Trying to make the record reflect the identification of the defendant. So reflected. How can you be certain that the defendant is the man who shot you? Okay, I will go through it all so you understand. Um, the driver, she had her hands on the steering wheel, so her hands are accounted for. The Front seat passenger, Vanessa Martinez, has her hands on both her legs like this. Both her hands are accounted for. Mr. Bueno has his left hand on his left leg. He has his right hand under a blanket. Valeria Jaime has a blanket, and she's wrapped up like this. I see both of the tops of her hands and her knuckles. Danny Vargas is laying on the window like this. Both of his hands are accounted for. As I've stated many a times after this, I got so focused on identifying that man over there and losing track of his right hand almost cost me my life. So I'm 100% sure he shot me. You're 100% sure? 100% sure. Mr. Lorenz. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Trooper Casey. Good afternoon. Good to see you. I would like to show you, I don't have much for you, I'd like to show you again, photo lineup 83030, it's exhibit, what day is it? 50? Yeah. Okay. This gentleman in position number one is actually the second person you focused on in the line, correct? I don't recall which order I focused on people, but he was the one I chose. Do you remember initially yeah. pointing the, per the person in position number six before you went to the person in position number one? You didn't sign it, but you went there and then you went to the person in position number one? I don't recall, but I would tell you if I did, it was because if you, again, you look at his goatee, it's not that full, firm one that number two does. So that's what I was focusing on and he didn't have as a full of face. So if I was looking at him, memory would serve me, that would be the reason. Um, again, he doesn't have that full face, in the, especially the neck bottom. He doesn't have that full goatee like number two does. What I'm asking is, at some point when you were presented with this lineup, yes. did you 
point to the person in position number six, and then pick the person in position number one? If I pointed the person at number six, it's probably because he, he elicited thought in me, but I didn't pick him, so I would say, no, I did not pick number six. It was just eliciting thought, and I picked number one because he was more closely resembling Ramon that night I dealt with him. Your Honor, if I may approach the witness. Mr. Casey, I want to show you page two from the interview you did on October 9th with Detective Butcher, Meraz, Myers, and the prosecutor were there. Sure. Look at number line 60 and just read that and see if that refreshes your recollection. Let me know when you're done. Okay. For the judge, may I speak to Ms. Lawrence? I'm not saying you picked him and, and, and said, yeah, that's him, but the, the detective says, the last set here, James, is 83030, and then he says number six. Okay, if you need more time, take as much time as you need, and there's something that's unintelligible. Okay, number one. Okay, go ahead and write on there if you need to. Does that, does that kind of take you back to October 9th? Well, again, I, I, the way I would, I mean, the only way I could answer that is, again, number six must have elicited some kind of thought in there so that I was pointing to him, but ultimately I chose number one. Certainly, certainly. So before the gunshot, you saw no movement in the car, correct? You're talking about my, yeah, okay, this is my second approach, correct. No, not at that time, no, I did not. So no movement prior to being shot. At that point in time when you've got your notepad in your hand. Yes. Correct? That's correct. You didn't observe a muzzle blast. No, I did not. And you did not see a firearm. I heard one, but I did not see one. Sorry. No, I didn't hear a muzzle blast, but I heard a shot, yes. But I did not see a gun. No, I did not. Thank you. You're welcome. That's all I have. Thank you. Ms. Dahl? In fairness, Detective Butcher and Myers and myself were not at that photographic lineup at the housekeeping set, right? Yes, I, yes. Did you say in that same recorded interaction with Detective Mraz? The other thing that struck me as odd was a passenger, uh, the male that wound up shooting me, he was a lot older. I did, yes. And so you were clear about that and the fact that he had a bald or shaved head, is that right? That's correct. on the Elmo. Image A. Put it uh, next to line up 83030. Fairness, could it have been possible that you were shown a very different image of the defendant in that photographic lineup? Well, that's correct. I mean, like I said, even in the, the black and white photo, it, does, it doesn't appear with that full, thick goatee as it does in number two. What did he look like back on October 8, 2014? Well, when I stopped him, he had a full T-shirt on. It was a, he wasn't wearing a muscle shirt. It was a full T-shirt, T-shirt with sleeves. Shot you. Did he have time to get rid of the gun, change his shirt, and get to a different location? Yeah, yeah, I'd imagine, yes. Are you sure it's the defendant that shot you in the face, sir? Like I said, I'm 100% sure he had, uh, I can account for every single hand, nine out of ten hands. Um, that one hand, it went under that blanket. Did I see a gun? No, I did not. 
Nobody else pulled a gun. I saw their hands. Uh, Danny Vargas did not lean across the window and shoot at me because he never moved. Um, uh, Martina, Vanessa Martinez did not shoot at me. Uh, Lori Richardson, the driver, never shot at me. Valeria Jaime never moved. She stayed under that blanket with her hands wrapped around there. Um, and uh, I lost track of one hand, and it was that man's hand right there. Ramon Bueno. Thank you. I see there are a number of juror questions. Okay, first question. When you leaned in to hear the passenger give his social, did you turn your head to hear better? And if so, how much time would you say you took your eyes off of him? No, when I, it was instantaneous. When I leaned in, because he started giving, uh, like I said, it was a six, oh, and when I heard the first number, oh, I was leaning in, but uh, I had my notepad and I was looking down, and it was, as soon as I heard the oh, it was, I mean, it was instantaneous. There was no delay. It was almost like, you know. Just before the passenger started giving you his social security number, the last you remember seeing his hands were left hand on his leg and right hand not seen under the center passenger's blanket? That's correct. On the, if it was, the blanket was, if, if I may, I'm just, okay. So you guys see, if he was sitting down or she was sitting down, that blanket was going down and it was down on the ground area. So that's why I lost track of his hands off his leg down in that area. If you were not looking up, how did you know the person seated behind the driver was the shooter? Okay, again, um, the, the two in the, the driver had her hands on the wheel, the passenger had her hands on her legs. Moan had one hand on his left leg, he had one hand under the blanket. Larry had both hands grabbing a blanket, holding it up. Danny Vargas was laying there. Nine out of ten hands I can account for. The one hand I can't account for, it was his right hand, and that would be the one holding the gun, shooting. Is it possible Valeria had a gun under the blanket? If you're asking if Valeria had the gun hidden under the blanket, it's po anything's possible. I mean, that could be possible. If you're asking if she shot, no, that's not possible, because, again, I counted for both her hands. I thought the witness stated that when he first asked all occupants to expose their hands because he noted defendant's right hand under the blanket, that the defendant did move his right hand to his thigh, but then stated later that just before he heard the explosion, the defendant's hand was under the blanket and was the only hand of all occupants that he could not see, and is why he believes it must have been the defendant who shot him. Can you explain the discrepancy? Can you read that one more time? I, oh, sorry. Absolutely. I thought the witness stated that when he first asked all occupants to expose their hands because he noted defendant's right hand under the blanket, that the defendant did move his right hand to his thigh. But then he stated later that just before he heard the explosion, the defendant's hand was under the blanket and was the only hand of all occupants that he could not see and why is why he believes it must have been the defendant who shot him. Okay, I, I get that. Okay, um, So the first time, that's what drew my attention to him the first time. Uh, because when I was talking to Lori on the initial stop, um, he was he was he was under that blanket. His hands were under that blanket somewhere, and that's what drew my attention because there was movement there. And um, you know, as a police officer, in that you know, late at night, movement in the back is very concerning, and especially because I could not see the back there with that tint in that blanket. So when I told everybody to show me their hands, yes, he placed his hands on his legs. I did see that while I was dealing with him, getting his name, date of birth, and everybody else in the car. 
when I lost track of his hands was the second approach I was at. This is after I had Trooper Cruz now Fano with me now. So now we're, the first time was basically, um, I was getting everybody's information. My second approach, um, now we're in the investigative stage of it. So I was, um, at this point, is where I lost track of his hands, because I said, like I said, I got so focused, it, it, was a ta- it was an error. It was a tactical error on my part. And as I said, it almost cost me my life. I got so focused on identifying him, trying to ID him, that I lost track of that right hand, and that hand went under the blanket. Every other hand I can account for. So, and a gun doesn't just fire on its own. So. Thank you. There's at least one other juror question. Council, please approach. Do you know when the picture of the defendant in the lineup was taken relative to when the defendant was taken into custody? Uh, no, I don't. And my answer to that would be, um, and I can tell you, especially working traffic enforcement, if you've noticed uh, in Arizona, uh, the driver's licenses, um, when you 20, turn 21, you do not have to get a picture, and generally until you're 65 again. So it was not uncommon for me or any trooper we deal with uh, to stop somebody who was in their early 50s and their license picture was when they were in their 20s. So that's not an uncommon thing in Arizona. In Massachusetts, you had to change every five years. So but no, that's not an uncommon thing. Was the witness, or were you, shown a lineup picture containing defendant's picture after he was taken into custody, the picture taken at the station? No, I was not, because I was, this was done at the hospital, this is pre him being taken into custody, so I was never shown a picture after that. Thank you. Yeah. I see no additional juror questions. Ms. Dahl, any follow-up? Thank you. I'd like to follow up on one of the juror questions regarding the timing of when you're looking, you're engaged with the rear passenger uh, driver's side male, and you're focused on him, but you're still keeping an eye, is that right, on the middle female passenger's hands and Danny Vargas's, which are above and against the rear passenger side window, correct? Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I had been a police officer for 14 years at this time. I had a lot of experience. Um, you know, so I wasn't, um, you know, it, it's not like I had my face buried in my notepad. Trust me, I we learned um, that was, you know, you learn how to take notes and keep your eye on people because, uh, you know, I have had, uh, you know, taking notes and had people come at me, you have to drop it and get ready. So that's not, you know, um, I, can, I can take notes and, you know. Um, so. I want you to put that notepad in your hand as you had it that evening. Exhibit number seven. Turn to the jurors, engage, and ask, what is your social security number? And show us when you look down at your notepad, at this, and when you heard the shot. Okay. So if I was if I was looking outside of the car, I'd be standing like this. If I was looking at you, um, I would be asking you, what's your social security number? And as you were giving it to me, I'm writing it down, but I'm keeping my eye on all, well, just like this. You know, I can keep it um, because these notepads, they give us, a, I mean, you unlimited supply at DPS. Do I care if my so, your social security number goes across my entire one page? I don't. It doesn't cost me anything. So the whole time, if I run a scrap, you know, sloppy, I know what my writing is, so I can watch you as I'm writing my note, just like that. So. And was it during that interaction, right when he is about, starts to give you your social security, that you looked down and you lost track of his right hand? I did, because I thought he was going to, I thought he was going to start identifying, positively identifying himself. Honestly, I thought it was just going to be, 
uh, like I said to you in the beginning, a traffic warrant or some warrant that, you know, he just didn't want to give his name up to. And I thought he was going to start coming forth, realizing that the game was up. Um, he wasn't going anywhere. Not As you were engaging with him, were you also scanning the back seat where Valeria was and Danny, uh, Danny Vargas was? Yeah, yeah, but like I said, um, I was watching her, but like I said, the whole time she had that blanket wrapped around her like she was cold, and Danny was sleeping. I mean, he was laying on that window um, like he was sound asleep. You also engaged, uh, you also heard in this trial that Trooper Cruz had his body against the back rear passenger, right? Yes, I did. And you now know that Danny Vargas is a relatively big boy? Yes. In your training and experience, when there is a large movement, if you're leaning against that rear passenger, is the car going to move a little bit? Yeah, yes, absolutely it would. And would that be something that a trained law enforcement officer like Ronaldo Cruz would know? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and to be honest with you, and, and so just to further that up. Um, Objection to the narrative. Oh, sorry. Sustained. Is there something significant about your training and experience regarding that type of scenario that it tells you? Yes, if Danny had been moving, I would have had that back window lowered. So that's if you that's why I kept that back window up. Um, as I always said, um, I didn't want to stir a hornet's nest at that time, meaning I did not want to bother him. He was no threat to me at that time. He was laying down. I had his hands accounted for. Um, so I, I was going to get to him if I didn't get shot. So his time was coming, but it's just I, I, I never got a chance to deal with Danny. Mr. Lorenz. Thank you, Your Honor. Trooper Casey, did Danny Vargas say to you, I hate cops? Yes, he did, and I replied, and so do I. Well, it's what he said, not what you said. He told you, I hate cops. Yes, he did. Thank you. You're welcome. There's another juror question. Oh, yes, you may. Did Mr. Bueno give you the impression that he was pro-law enforcement? No, no, he gave me a false name. Are you done? Ms. Dahl? Oh, I'm done. I was just waiting for you. Yeah. <laughs> we now have a, a rhythm. If you did not see a hand raised to shoot you, could it be true that any of the op occupants could have moved their hands to collect or reveal a gun and shoot? No, it's not possible. As I've explained, um, all their hands are accounted for. Nine out of ten hands are accounted for. Um, it's not possible. Uh, his... Uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I repeat it again. Lori's hands are on the wheel. Vanessa's are on her legs. Ramon has one hand on his left leg. He has one hand under a blanket. Valeria's got the blanket wrapped up like this. I see both her hands. Danny is laying on the window. I see both his hands. There's no other, there's no other way. And guns don't fire without a trigger being pulled. So, um, Gun was never pulled. I've been asked that question before with DPS uh, and Turtle. Um, no gun was ever pulled. It was fired from under that blanket. Was there space between Valeria's hands under the blanket for a gun to be hidden? Well, yeah. It was, I mean, it was a, a, the blanket went down to the floorboard, so there's definitely space. I would agree with that. There's space, too, because that's the only way there could have been. I'll repeat the question because I'm not sure your answer was responsive. Was there space between Valeria's hands under the blanket for a gun to be hidden? Oh, no, 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 no. Because Valeria had her hands, look, Valeria is holding the blanket under her neck. Her hands were up here. There was no gun. I mean, I mean her hands were like this. There's no way she could put a gun between those hands. Thank you. Follow-up, Ms. Dahl. No, Your Honor. Any follow-up, Mr. Lorenz? No, Your Honor. All right. Seeing no additional juror questions, that does conclude your testimony. Thank you very much Thank for you. coming in. You are excused. Ms. Dahl, would you like to call your next witness? Your Honor, the state rests.
All right. At this time, we are going to take a quick break. You may go back to the jury room. Remember the admonition applies. You are not allowed to discuss the case. Even though the state has rested, the case has not been turned over to you for your deliberation. You are not to discuss anything that occurred in the courtroom. See you back here in a little bit. All right, to the jury. I do, Your Honor. I, we move for a directed verdict pursuant to Rule 20. Um, as to all counts, 1 through 9, as there is no substantial evidence to support a conviction. That's all I have. So, just one? Well, all the, I'm just speeding through here looking at the indictment, the one that was adjusted for trial. It's All the one through eight, correct? Yes, they were renumbered, correct? One through eight. All right. Ms. Dahl, any response? The state believes that the court has seen sub substantial evidence to support conviction in this case, and uh, as counsel has done, the state also relies upon your observations of it. This really isn't an argument you saw at all, and um, it's going to come down to not whether it's going to come down to a who done it. Is there, and in this case, so if if the defendant was the shooter, he and based upon his documented gang ties, I would turn to Detective Clint Davis's testimony, then he's guilty of all counts. If he was not the shooter, then then he walks. But there is substantial evidence to show that in fact uh, he was the shooter, and because of that and his documented gang ties, he is guilty of all counts. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Lorenz? No, Your Honor. All right. The court having considered the evidence in the light most favorable to the non-moving party, court finds that there is substantial evidence to warrant a conviction. The Rule 20 motion is denied. Thank you, Judge. The parties have been provided a copy of the final <coughs> jury instructions. Did the state approve those instructions? Yes. Did the defense approve those instructions? Yes, Your Honor. All right, counsel, can I have you please approach?